Hey guys, okay, so I know some of you are going to be moving on to more challenging things next year, and so I wanted to offer you something this summer um, that you could read with me. Um, I'm going to be posting up the audio files on YouTube with just uh, a plain image so you can read along with me. But I found this really great book. It's called The Lost Novel, Jules Verne. It's by Jules Verne. Uh, it's called Paris in the 20th Century. Now, Jules Verne was a French author, and he started writing in 1863. That's right, 1863. And this novel was not found. It was in a safe that the family had, and they just didn't open it until 1989. So, uh, quite a while ago. Um, and it was found because they opened the safe and all of a sudden they found this new novel by James Verne, Jules Verne. Now Jules Verne is also the author of things like 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, um, let's see, My Life in a Balloon for five weeks or something, or Around the World in 80 Days, um, uh, From the Earth to the Moon, you name it, he's written some amazing science fiction at a time when France was just starting to codify their financial system. They were starting to deal with modernizing, not much like the United States. But Jules Verne was a really big fan of Edgar Allan Poe and um, some other industrialist writers of the United States. So um, I figured we would start reading this. And um, so I'm going to read you some of the introduction, which is by Eugene or Eugene. Weber, um, and then we would start reading this chapter by chapter because it is a very interesting book. And it was written in 1863, and he predicted what life would be like in France in 1960. And the cool thing is, is that some of his predictions were right, and some of them were a little weird. And we'll talk about that as we read through the book. But here is part of the introduction, okay? On page... Let's see, I believe uh, 21. When Jules Verne died in 1904 at 77, his world fame was a little worn. His name on a title page no longer sold books like hotcakes. But for two or three decades after his first triumph in 1863 with Five Weeks in a Balloon, few French novelists, if any, enjoyed comparable world success. A bestseller in his lifetime, which is rare, guys, with 1.6 million copies of his French edition sold by 1904 and still more after his death, he remains the most translated of French authors. 224 translations in 23 countries. Son of a comfortable provincial family, the lad grew up in Nantes, the great port on the Loire, which is a river, studied law as his lawyer father wanted, but soon followed his literary inclinations into the theater, writing comedies and operettas. One, with music by Offenbach. If you've not heard him, he's amazing. Then, helping to manage the theater founded by his friend and patron, Alexandre Dumas, who is also an author. Married in 1857, he bought into a financial agency, worked as a broker on the stock exchange, but continued to write poems, stories, lyrics, and plays until Dumas introduced him to his own publisher, Pierre-Jules Hetzel editor of Balzac, Hugo, Baudelaire, and George Sand, who was, the serial, who was to serialize and edit the 64-volume series of Verne's Extraordinary Voyages over some 40 years. So these are all extremely famous French authors. After the triumph of five weeks, Hetzel, his publisher, our editor, offered Jules Verne a contract for three books a year, paid roughly at the same rate that he paid George Sand, and also hired him as a regular contributor to a young people's magazine, the Review of Education and Recreation, where many of Verne's novels would be published in serial form. The theatrical experience was not wasted either, for the storyteller adapted many of his novels for the stage, notably Around the World in 80 Days, written in 1874, The Children of Captain Grant, written in 1878, Michael Strogoff, 1880, and a number of others. 
Since theater was the cinema of those days, the success of his plays increased both fame and revenues, whilst, unsurprisingly, one of the first French films made in 1902 took as its subject an 1865 adventure from the Earth to the Moon, whose original subtitle read, A Direct Crossing in 97 Hours and 20 Minutes. Wow, way to math. With a steady income assured, the family moved to Madame Fern's hometown, Amiens, in Picardy, to the northwest of Paris, where Jules Fern could pursue his research in comfort. By 1895, he had accumulated 20,000 filing cards, attend the Literary Academy, stroll, and sail. Work never ceased. Like Georges Simenon, another tireless artisan of letters, the successful author used his successive boats as floating studies where much of his writing was done. He traveled. He had always dreamed of discovering faraway lands. Now he could afford even a voyage to America. But most of his traveling, as before, was done on the printed page in his imagination. In the generation before Verne's birth, a great revolution, or rather a string of revolutions going off like firecrackers, had introduced the politics of the impossible. In his own lifetime, a similar string of technological and scientific revolutions introduced the impossible into everyday life. Mankind's experience of space, time, speed, mass, movement was radically altered. It fell to Jules Verne to bring this home to millions of readers, explain it, illustrate it, and suggest what it might mean for generations to come. Fascinated by the new world of transformed by railroads and great steamers, Verne stood at the crossroads of present and future, a poet of technology, of science, of the power and the menace that they hold. In 1869, he imagined a mission to the moon that prefigured the fight, flight of Apollo 9 one century later. Our space vehicle, Frank Borman, the astronaut, wrote to Verne's grandson, was launched from Florida, like Verne's. It had the same weight and the same height, and it splashed down in the Pacific a mere two and a half miles from the point mentioned in the novel. In 1879, he evoked the first artificial satellite. In 1882, he wrote about the sort of cosmic rays that physicists pursued between the two world wars. The visionary writes about balloons, helicopters, heavier-than-air machines of every sort, about the Earth, 1864, and its geology, right, journey to the center of the Earth, about lunar travel, 1865, 1870, about polar exploration, 1866, about underwater travel, 1869, right, 20,000 leagues under the sea, about electricity, which powers the submarine, Nautilus, or produces telephote, enabling people to see each other at a distance. Woohoo! FaceTime, guys. And of course, he writes about the travel, about travel and exploration. All his stories are full of wonders, all a bit ominous, and few are more curious than the unpublished manuscript that Fern's great grandson discovered in 1989, when the sale of a family home forced him to dispense with a great bronze safe long believed to be empty. The keys to the safe had been lost. It had to be opened with a blowtorch. Temporarily tucked under a pile of linen, the pages discovered in 1989 were examined later, authent authenticated and identified as a text that Hetzel, his editor, had rejected late in 1863. It's a hundred feet below five weeks in a balloon. Your M Michael is a real goose with his verses. Can't he carry parcels and remain a poet? and the clincher. No one today will believe your prophecy. Vern appears to have accepted Hetzel's verdict. Not so our generation. Published in 1994, Paris in the 20th century proved an unexpected success with 200,000 copies sold in its first year and 30 translations underway, including this one. So, you get the idea that quite a few of the things that Fern predicted really happened ex almost exactly the way he predicted them. Maybe not in the time that he predicted them. And he's got some funny ideas about, about like writing and things like that and certain things of technology, but, you know, those things hadn't been invented yet, so how could he think of them, right? But he sure did come up with a lot of really clever ideas. So next time, after uh, we have read this bit of the introduction, we are going to start on page, official page three, not the introduction pages, 
Uh, chapter one, the academic credit union with the idea, he had the idea that, um, with the standardization of banking in France, um, the schooling would also become standardized and part of the economic push to standardize would be that big banks would take over schooling and incentivize it and monetize it. And so in his 1960, um, the big banks can, are part of big schooling, right? Because they've consolidated everything. Monopoly is like the way to go in his version of France. And so we'll start there next time. All right, guys, that's all for now. Of Paris in the 20th Century by Jules Verne, the Del Rey Science Fiction Edition. Bye, guys.